And I hope everyone can hear me. Um, uh, obviously, hopefully, I can work my way through this uh, presentation on uh, on my laptop here. So uh, um, I'm just going to present out what I've seen in the in the uh, in my uh, ten months within the uh, union and. Uh, our concerns and uh, also things that we need to address uh, to go forward. And um, there's a number of things that we uh, uh, need to improve on and other things that uh, we need to keep them, keep working on. So look here, this is, uh, I'll start it off with my areas of concern. Um, concerning moving forward, some of the issues that we've been faced with, you know, the obvious is that uh, what is the problem um, that we, we've been addressed with? What do we see we need to improve on? Uh, what are we doing about it? Obviously, uh, how we're going to react? How do we improve? Um, how it looks at the moment? What our issues are? And uh, moving forward to uh, Rugby World Cup 2019, uh, which will obviously sneak up on us quicker than we expect. Um, so, with that, what is the problem? To me, the biggest one of the biggest concerns I, I find with us is that our players just don't play enough rugby. Um, uh, at a level that is going to um, allow them to uh, prepare and go into international matches. Um, our, our players, people around around the country can look at times uh, the players that we select and that's always going to be debatable because uh, that's what sports are all about. Um, you know, we discuss what we see and what's out there, but the, the, that's not the issue in my opinion. Um, the, the biggest one is uh, where they're all coming from and it, it's a level of rugby that our players are playing and then we uh, need to take them from club rugby into international rugby and the preparation is not good enough. It's uh, They go to club training Tuesday, Thursday, play Saturday. The level of rugby, club rugby, what I've seen around the place is poor. Uh, you've got to look at what you're competing with around the world and uh, the level of rugby that players come from to go to international rugby has got to be improved. And so that to me is our, one of our biggest problems. The facts, if we look back to um, uh, in my time and the campaigns that we've had, um, started off in June of last year, when we got together, uh, I, you know, the players, I'd, talking around the squad, the amount of guys, what they've been doing in the previous weeks. And as it states there, of the squad that we brought in there, the 29 players, 14 players had had less than two games of rugby in the last 10 weeks. 13 had less than five, and only two players had more than five. And in some cases, some had no rugby. And so not only were they not conditioned to play rugby, um, you know, the the, the they weren't prepared. And so we're always going to be behind the, 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 the hind foot if we uh, prepare, and that's how we go into to our international rugby's. So the big concern there was in June is that just no one had played any rugby. Uh, and this wasn't a one-off thing because then, um, you know, we go into uh, November. Um, the situation was that most players had, you know, obviously in November have, have played rugby together. Uh, but the the problem was at at what level of rugby had they played? And as you can see here, 18 of the squad that we used in November come from domestic club rugby. Um, and and in some cases it's just starting, and some they've been playing a little bit. But again, it's a level of rugby they're playing at. Four are playing pro two in in France, and again, that's not the highest level of rugby either. You know, they they're, they're very big. It's very forward oriented rugby, it's, it's smash um, and grab type of rugby. Uh, then we have the championship in England where we have four players. Again, it's, you know, scrum for penalties, kick to the corners, maul. Um, it's the type of rugby they play there. And uh, we have two at the time of the squad uh, that played, play in the Pro 12 and one in the English Premiership. So really, you know, getting some rugby, of the squad we used in November, only three players were playing rugby at a reasonable level. Um, and then you've got the concern of the way they play rugby in, in some of those competitions. So the problem is e each campaign we go to, we, we're faced with the same issues each time. And so that leads into the America. Yeah, 
ARC that we just have completed. Since the uh, Samoan test um, that we finished at the end of uh, November, I think it's the 25th of November, uh, the 32 players that we um, used in the ARC, 16 had no rugby games at all from that period of time. So 16 guys turned up ready in February with no rugby. Seven had one game and two played in two games. Seven were playing overseas in France, so you know, and that can be academy type of rugby. Um, so again, the same problems faced. You know, I'm, I'm repeating myself for the same things about where we come from. With the uh, so with that set in mind, we 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 clearly in the ARC of this year took a mind that we need to start developing some players and seeing how they can step up because a lot of the work and preparation has not been done for us. So we're going to have to do it ourselves. And that meant that we had to, we looked at, I didn't want to because what we're doing is mindful of fact is we keep bringing out the same old guy that we know is not good enough to play rugby at the high level, but because we have to make the numbers, get the squad together, we keep throwing back names that get found out time and time again. So we clearly, with that in mind, uh, in this uh, ARC, we, we decided we wanted to have a look at some of the young guys coming through and seeing if some of them are going to show the, the, the right signs and signals and development that we could actually look at using them. And, um, you know, they'd be potentially long-term projects that we could have them up in place and, uh, you know, not, not so much look at are they ready now, but very much in mind, um, looking at uh, Japan 2019. And so with that, we, we, we selected, I think in, in total, there was uh, something like, um, uh, there was two 19 year olds, we had four or five 20 year olds, uh, we had three or four 21 year olds and two or three 22. So we had 12 guys under 22 in the ARC that we just used. Uh, did all of them step up? No, but some showed some real good promise and are going to show that they're worthwhile developing and spending time and with that they could be a possibility that a few of them will be ready for the World Cup. So that was promising and using that. Now, how does it look, you know, for June, again, coming up and we've got World Cup qualifying? Well, the problem again, as I said, that we're facing the same problems time and time for every campaign. The BC competition finishes in April, the finals on, I think, the first weekend of May. Club rugby is just starting over in Ontario and uh, Alberta. Club rugby finishes in the first week in May in, the, in, in Europe, because um, <clears throat> most of the guys are in situations they, they won't be making playoffs. Um, some players are playing. Uh, but, you know, we also have three of our better players um, in the UK in professional clubs that are not played and not been used. Um, as I have mentioned here with uh, Connor Braid went to Worcester after our November window was playing up to Christmas. And I don't know if he's had a game or got on the field since Christmas. Jake and Nicky came back um, and uh, from UK and uh, Northampton picked them up as cover over the Christmas period in Six Nations. And again, he's had two development games the whole time he's been there. They're just not using them. And obviously DJ Sears Dura has not uh, been used by Glasgow. And again, consequently has been let go at the end of the season. So three players just sitting there and not um, getting any rugby under their belt in preparation for, for June. So it's a major concern, and the, and the fact is, it's not only just the rugby; it's the condition to play rugby, and uh, this is where um, you know we can work, and we are growing with them off-field conditioning. It, it's on field, and uh, some of our players are, are just not getting an opportunity overseas, and some that are maybe haven't taken them as well as they should have. So again, they're all the problems that we're faced with going forward. So what are we doing about it? A key to me is we've got to try and keep working to get players playing at a better level. So if that's, you know, again, um, to the UK, uh, even playing championship there, it, it is, at least it is training and preparing and working daily. Um, we've developed and, and are working through and improving the carded program out of Victoria 
um, which is going well and we're always trying to get variation of coaches involved in that um, but we've, you know we've got the guys there's a few there rehabbing but uh, that kind of program is one thing we're doing but also uh, Jim and I, myself have been working with uh, uh, clubs provinces in New Zealand to get some players down here with the potential to play uh, in their competition which is a minor 10 cup that does not start till um, August so uh, if these guys that have come, we've got about four coming to New Zealand now this week uh, to play club rugby, uh, with all of set in mind to uh, take that opportunity to prove to then come back after the June internationals to play uh, Minor Cup 10. Um, so with all that said and done, um, we have concerns and they're not gonna be fixed in five minutes. What do we do? Uh, what are we doing about it? And what do we need to do to prepare for our game against the USA come um, June, home and away. And the, the, because of the lack of rugby and, and players in the UK finishing, there'll be a month in advance, they'll be finished so they don't go to pasture. Um, club rugby's finished. And again, as I said, it's not the ideal um, level to prepare for international rugby. We're looking at organising maybe a couple of trial games against BC and the Wolfpack in preparation for uh, Georgia. You know, obviously we are going to have to look at how we manage supplying the workload of our squad in that uh, window in June, because number one priority obviously for us all is to uh, qualify for the World Cup. And that's the last two internationals against uh, the USA home and away. So that said, we uh, have uh, uh, Georgia first up um, in Calgary, followed by, um, Romania in uh, Alberta and uh, um, Edmonton, sorry, Edmonton. So uh, we, we, you know, have got two big physical games uh, as some preparation. Uh, we do not have the size of squad to go play all four of them. So we're gonna look at how we manage the players and what's the best way of preparing for those games. And said that we're gonna look at all going well to enlarge the squad for the first game. We want to have two hit out trials to sort of get some rugby under the belt of the players that need it more than others and also prepare a, a team to play georgia now we may not put a full strength team out there because number one is is looking for the world cup and we'll look at our putting our team out against romania and then on to uh, uh, usa and preparation for that and hopefully um we don't have any uh other long-term injuries like uh, Jeff Hasler with his rupture in his Achilles. Hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, Matt Evans, he's gone too with an AC and MCL. Um, so there's two uh, regular starters that are gone. So uh, hopefully we don't get too many more between now and then, fingers crossed. So that's our preparation and what we're looking at, uh, putting our focus on that for uh, June and qualifying for the World Cup. Um, the other thing is what we're doing is, is the key is with um, Mike DZ, our, our strength and conditioning coach, who's doing a great job in Victoria. But the problem is, as I said, is that we have to get him in line with the provinces more so. Um, Mike is, you know, he, he works hard, he's enthusiastic, he's energetic. Uh, but again, it, it's, it's, it's players are breaking down because of the level of work that sometimes they get put on them when they're not used to it. And so he as he's written here, I don't need to read it all out for you, you can see what's in front. Um, the players, how they present themselves. And um, when I think back to June last year, when we presented, there is a, we work by a yo-yo, which is a conditioning running tool. And um, the thing is that uh, when our, we tested our squad in June last year, it was quite appalling. Guys even coming from professional clubs were not uh, um, getting to levels that you'd send props home for back in, you know, professional countries. And, uh, you know, if we are going to, we're not the biggest pl rugby playing uh, as player size goes. We're not the biggest team going around. So the one thing that, you know, we're not going to physically dominate or beat teams that way. We've, we've got to find our way to play that suits us. But there's only one way we can do that is if, if the players are conditioned to be able to handle it. And so we have to work to improve the conditioning 
of our players right across the country, not only in Canada, but also we have to get the message to our players in the UK and France that if they're not doing enough conditioning work, that they have to take the onus on themselves to put extra time in. Because if we're going to be successful, we've got to be fit. And we're just not fit enough. And guys break down through that. And then uh, consequently, when we come to train, uh, we try to put any volume into guys in preparation for a game, they're breaking. And so the big work on it is that we need to get to work to help Mike um, to get the guys, the athletes up, to be better prepared to play at the level we need them to do. So moving forward, a big thing is taking that on, we've got to create training centres around the provinces. Mike needs to be in line with, you know, someone in Vancouver, someone in Alberta, someone in Ontario, you know, around the country, we need to have training centres that he is working with strength and conditioning coaches on the conditioning and the program work these guys are doing. And doing it once or twice a week is not good enough. If we're going to accept that, we're not going to accept trying to improve and be better. We need to get our players training and playing and be able to execute what we need them to do. We also need to get at our younger players uh, and give them a more meaningful training program. I think we need to put a lot more focus on the young players coming through in the game. Our under-20 program, to me, is crucial going forward. We've got to do more to make that every goal to make sure that they're at least getting to the trophy year in, year out, and building them to get to the championship. And, and the players, a great example of that was uh, last year when I saw our under-20s played North Otago. Now these guys, some of these guys have come out on playing the under 19 tournament last year, age grade in, in, in July in um, Toronto. And uh, they, they showed some really promise and some good depth there. But they came up against a North Otago team from New Zealand that were not as a, a strong team. And they just got intimidated by playing against men. And what really stood out is these guys are just not playing men early enough. And, and the standout player, for an example, in the uh, under-19s and shows a lot of promises, young Jake Teal. Now, Jake was dominant, was most probably the best player of the tournament of the under-19s I saw. When he came to play, you know, he, he against North Otago, uh, you know, again, like the others, he was dominated by the opposition. And the fact is that we have him now training with us in our card of program in Victoria. But the point is, he's a promising young footballer of 19, 20 years of age, and he's done no conditioning in the gym. Our, Mike had to take him back to basically educate him on a broom handle start weights to get the, get the right techniques before he moved into weights. So he's starting that process at 19 or 20. We need to be starting that process. Of, you know, some countries are starting it at 15, 16. You know, we need to at least be having our guys, you know, 17, 18 starting programs, you know, starting to work on it and uh, waiting to come out at the end of an under 20s program before they start understanding and learning what the gym's about is we're missing the boat and that they're just not going to be ready. And so we need to make sure with these training centers around the country, we're giving our young guys every chance to to grow, to improve, to be international players and take our game where we need to do it. And that's important right across. And we need alignment, we need support, and we need to be working together to make that happen. We need to also, another key is the CRC competition. It, to me, is, is, is it's, it's not created yet or doing what we need it to do. We need to have too many players for one reason or are not available for it. We need all our best players in Canada playing in it, and we need it to be meaningful. So the competition is not just run over a week. We're not giving it, uh, you know, the the due respect that we need to develop our players by, you know, playing three games in eight days. They'll break because they can't handle doing that. We need it to be that they're training, they're preparing, they're reviewing, that you know, doing work in the gym and they're understanding what rugby's about, taking it to the next level. 
And uh, we can only do that if we work with the CRC to make sure that program works. And then, you know, we've got to, with that, um, you know, if we're going to condition our players to be better for international rugby, you know, I think we've got to align ourselves more with the um, other countries. Um, you know, <clears throat> when I look around what we're competing with and against, and what other countries are doing, you know, we've got to ask ourselves, are we start keeping a, a, a head above water? And there are a lot of challenges because of the size of our country and where players are based. But at the end of the day, we've got to look at, so how are we going to get, and where do we want rugby to go? Where do we want to get it? Because, you know, like even being in Brazil this year, a place like Brazil, which rugby is not a priority, obviously, you know, soccer mad, um, they have three training centers around uh, the around the country and each training center they have 20 uh, under 18 18 year old academy players in it and they have about 20 25 senior men training in each center so they do that and they train four days a week in those programs so that's what's happening in brazil romania have seven professional club teams operating on a 1.8 million dollar budget so they're playing, training, and developing. The big men and they're playing. Now, is it great rugby? No, but it's a starting point, and it's a point where they'll only get stronger for it. You know, at the, when we look at our rankings and where we want to go in rugby and the teams we're competing with to be in that sort of, you know, 12, 14, 15 position in the world, um, you know, the, the, the Pacific nations, Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, 80% of their squad all play in France or the UK. So they're all playing professional, they're training daily and they're developing and learning to play. Is it ideal in all cases? No, but at least the guys are in environments where they have a purpose and they know what they're working towards and they, they spend each day preparing for that. And so the thing is, that's what's happening in world rugby. Now, if we have aspirations to take our game to the next level, we have to look at it and say, what are we doing? What are we doing to make it? Because we, there's no one has a, um, a magic wand. No one has the uh, fact that it's say, so, well, it's the coaching. You know, you can point the finger at me. That's what head coaches are, the heads are on the block. But the point is, we've got to look at what are we picking from? And I, I also look at the campaigns that we've had. Um, in some cases, guys are injured and not available, so I have to go to the guys who have been around a while and we talk about who can replace them. But, you know, and people might say, why'd you take him? There's this guy here. But again, they're all coming from the same nest. And in uh, and, and some cases, they're not playing any rugby. So the point is that, uh, you know, that argument will always go in place. And I've seen guys say, this guy in uh, BC should be, be, he's the best player in this position, he should be in that. But you see them take the next step up. And, and again, the mistakes occur because they're just not used to the pace and under pressure. So if we're gonna improve our skills, we've gotta be able to be conditioned to be able to play at a faster pace and be able to execute under pressure. And being comfortable with it, Doing it once, you know, you know, a couple of times and then going away from that rugby for three months and then coming back to it is not going to improve it. You know, you'll see subtle changes and improvements, but we've got to find out how can we test our players more consistently to deliver to be able to give us the results we want. And that's what we need to have. You know, ideally in a perfect world, one day we'll have a professional team playing in a professional competition that then it shows a shop window for our youth to, to aspire to. And, you know, we can do that. We're then going to start putting our players in programs to develop, to grow and be better for Rugby Canada. Um, so they are our challenges, those are some of the concerns. Do we all have all the, the, the answers? No, but we, we've got to work together and we've got to be aligned and know what we have a common goal is to improve and you know, have rugby where it should be standing in the community throughout Canada. So um, gentlemen, um, thanks for your time. Um, now I'm sure there's a window here for some questions. I'm sure if there's some questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, 
and uh, yeah, good luck for the, with everyone. So my question was, what role can the universities in Canada play to try and support you and the program? Look, I think universities, uh, you know, there's some very big universities around the country, I, understand. I, I don't understand the full ins and outs of them, but they have a massive part to play because a lot of our youth are going through them. And the fact is, if we can get, you know, there's, um, if, if we can help and work together with our players, and the starting base is is conditioning. The fact of, of the rugby improvement, that, that's another thing, but we've got it, that there's a couple of sides to developing the player. One is we've got to have them conditioned and work to be able to play the game. Then we have to get them to be consistently playing rugby at a better game. So a part the universities can have around the country, as I said, is when we start to look at creating centres that we can discuss and work with and regularly start in tune with uh, about the programs we're putting on the players with all the facilities they have. I, I think it's a, it's a huge stepping stone that could help us develop our young players. So I think the university has a big part to play in it. Thanks, Mark. I've just had someone else ask a question. So um, you've, you've highlighted club rugby as a, a challenging environment to prepare players to play on the national team. What would your advice yep. be to the provinces to try and support in that aspect of, of a player pathway, of a player pathway? Well, what I believe the provinces have got to do is they've got to recognise they have to get out amongst all their clubs, they work with their clubs and identify the better players. Once they identify their better players, they start training and working those better players to be conditioned. So then they start working with them. So they're conditioning them to be better for their club. So the more work they do with that player, he's going back to his club as a better player, better condition. And that will bring the standard up of the club player. But also by working that player, once the CRC starts, the player is better conditioned to be actually show what he's capable of doing. But the guys are turning up to CRC and they're not conditioned. You know, we, I don't care if guys have been playing for a while. I, there was not one guy that turned up in June last year. There was one guy turned up last June for our test window that was fit. And that was the youngest guy in Ben Massage. So we've got to start that there. The conditioning starts at the base. And that is with the clubs, the universities and the provinces. And if they have that alignment with us and are working with those players, we can send our coaches around and do school work with them at different times. But Mike, our strength and get it is setting levels, working with them, and is talking to them weekly, daily, about what we're doing. So the question has been asked, Mark, uh, in relation to under 16s and under 17s players, what do you feel the, the national team can do to help um, clarify and identify what the needs are at that age group. What would you say are the main, I suppose the best way to ask questions, what do you think are the most important things for players at that age to be focusing on? Well, one is, is, is starting to identify talent. You know, we've got to start identifying, and it's just raw talent. You know, I think sometimes when we start looking at players or ability, we try to look for too much, and then we get too critical. We start saying, oh, you yeah, know, he's good at this and that. We're going to be just look at the raw thing. Is it, is it raw or just he's got speed? Or he's getting a high ball or he can kick a ball? You know, and then in time with the right work, we can develop them. So I think at that young age, we want to identify it and we start to get them into good habits. And that's the way they train and, and doing some schoolwork. Because I don't think we need to be concerning ourselves too much of looking about the final product. And I'm thinking talent ID and checking, we sometimes people look for too much in a player. We just need to look at the raw product of what we can work with. And it takes time. Um, you know, we, we, we just need to be, see some good habits of a guy, just one thing, something good. And if he's got, then get him into the right type of training, it's that work ethic that we're gonna start developing and working with these guys. And skill development is an ongoing thing. I don't care who you are and what level of rugby you play at, you never stop working on your skill development. So the greatest players in the world are the ones that put the most work into that. So the sooner we get that habit and their understanding is the harder they work at that, the better they will be in the long term. Uh, 
Um, I can, we can probably answer this now, but the, the question was asked, can we share the strength and conditioning re resources between men, women, sevens and fifteens at a regional level? I can answer that absolutely. So we have all of that information, we actually can, and yeah. the team have prepared that to share with all of the provinces leading the meeting this weekend, uh, and, and all of the provinces are, are being provided with that information as well. Too. Ideally, it would be great if Mike had half a dozen guys around the country that he's speaking to every week. You know, telling them what we're doing, what he wants, and working with those to give them, help them with their programs to develop our plot. So, you know, at the moment, Mike does not speak to anyone. If we can have, if we can create and start developing those programs that he's working on, we're going to start moving in the right direction. I've just been asked to ask you, if you've got all the senior leadership of Rugby Canada, the whole community here, if there's one thing you could ask of them to support the team, what would it be? No pressure. Um, <laughs> um, have us have a professional rugby team. Beautiful, thank you. Um, and one, one other one, this is, I suppose, fair enough too, there's, we've talked a lot about some of the challenges, but someone's asked, can you point out some of the positives that you see in, in rugby in Canada? The positives. Oh, look, look. I, I'll tell you one of the great positives. I've been uh, I've been around this game a long time, and the one one of the key things that stands out to me is in all our programs we have. We had June uh, ARC in February, uh, November. So we're away and we're together for four weeks, as in the ARC five weeks. The one thing is, no matter what we do, what we ask of the players. I, I'm, I'm blown away by the way they'll always go ahead and do what we ask of them. So we train them for an hour and a half or two hours or, or an hour at 10 C speed, they do it. They front up, there's no bitching, there's no fighting. They uh, Sometimes I'd actually like to see a little bit more niggle amongst them in the training. But the, so the thing is, the guys do what's asked of them. And you know that, that that's a real positive. So that shows the type of character we have in our players to just knock it down and do it. What what our issues are is another thing going forward, and we've talked on them is um, getting them to be able to do it consistently under pressure. And uh, you know we've got to get our players being able to play at a level, and uh, they do try and they do want. One thing that I just harp on them is the when we played Russia. I don't know for those that saw the game. We scored four converted tries in the first 20 minutes. And the fact is the running metres the guys got to at that stage was up to about 60 metres a minute, right? Um, that was they could handle that for 20 minutes and they just fell away. And the, again, uh, the altitude, um, conditioning just played a big part. Now, we got to 60 for 20 minutes. It fell away to 20, 40, then down to about 25 over the quarters of the game. Super rugby is played at 80, 80 metres a minute. Uh, and consistently, England, the premiership's about 65%. International rugby, sometimes the All Blacks in England, Australia can get up to 100 metres a minute. So those are the levels that you've got to get people conditioned to play. So we have our guys drive and aspire to get there. They want to, the guys you work with want to get better. It's how we give them the right programs to get better is our challenge. Thanks for taking the time back and uh, obviously we're all looking forward to, to June and obviously a very successful June. Thanks for uh, supporting and, and providing us with some insight today. Much appreciated. Uh, now being a pleasure, I'd just like to hope that it all, the AGM is a, a good one and uh, everyone enjoys it. And, uh, you know, we're all, all working together and, uh, you know, I think if we do that and the right people support each other, you know, we can we can take this game forward. So I look forward to meeting more of you in, in my travels over the next period of time. So thanks for your time.